I like working at the intersection of art and technology because it, it feels so relevant. Mm -hmm. um, art always feels relevant to me, I think, but technology is really difficult, but we have to deal with it all the time. And I guess when I talk about one, they kind of relate to the other, so I feel like art is the same way. It's really difficult, but so important. We're going to talk tonight about uh, personal relationships or intimacy in a digital world, human connections in a digital world. Um, and um, what do we mean when we say the digital world? Um, well, first of all, it runs pretty much everything in our lives. Um, we're intimately involved with it. Uh, it, you know, is the 7,000 pieces of data that um, Facebook holds on us someplace in some dark box. It's the interferences that Gmail makes in our daily lives, recording data. It's the, all the programs that underlay the sewer system and the city lights everywhere. It's our sleep apps. It's how we consume politics and um, history and culture. Um, so uh, yeah, it is ubiquitous. Um, and despite this, all this personalized data and convenience, we want to know, does this make us actually closer to one another or does it drive us apart? Mm -hmm. uh, and so these are all these questions. We're not going to answer all of them tonight, but we're going to cover three parts of them, basically. Um, how the, we relate to ourselves through this digital interface, how we relate to others, and then also how we relate to nature. Um, and uh, since the other artists have already been introduced, um, I'm going to get right to the questions. This is how it's sort of going to work this evening, is that we're each going to describe a bit about uh, the art that we do, um, and uh, people will be allowed to perhaps ask questions during that, um, but also at the end. Uh, and I will pepper them with sort of general questions that uh, will interrupt their flow as they go along. Much um, like the internet. Much <laughs> like the internet. Um, so the first person who is going to talk is Keaton, Keaton Fox. And, um, you know, one of the things that I like about your work is it's so sort of average and like quotidian and uh, not special. And yet you take these little sort of moments and you make resonances with them that just sort of move outward. Um, and so they become special in this way. Um, and um, so Keaton is a multidisciplinary artist. Uh, she's an educator and a curator. Uh, and she is the assistant director at Boston Cyber Arts, which puts her in a good position to understand a great deal about this subject. Uh, she's exhibited nationally and internationally, physically and on the web. Uh, and she creates visual experiments that explore playfully the varied realities of our time. Um, and she's especially interested in those that are frustrating. So um, uh, I'm going to start by asking you to just begin your presentation and okay. uh, talk about some of these projects. Okay, sounds good. So my name is Keaton Fox and I'm here today to talk about um, how technology has changed the way that humans interact with one another. And I'm gonna show you that by looking at three different projects that I've created over the past six years, I would say. Um, so yes, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, educator, curator, all these different things. And I also have a lot of ways that I work with media, just like I have a lot of different titles. So the works that we're gonna look at today are, there's one installation piece, one video art piece, and one painting project. So let's just get right into it. Oh, this is my art of opposition. So because my work is so varied, um, there's one, I wanted to talk about this one idea that really holds them all together, and it's the art of opposition, and it's, this idea where I find things that are opposing ideas and put them together. And I think that's the most interesting way to learn about anything in this world is to figure out what one side thinks and then the other side and put those together. And it's how I make my decisions in my everyday and it's also how I create my art projects. So some of these themes look like natural and virtual, academic and accessible, 
which goes along with art and tech as well. I think the art world and the tech world can be really um, come off as pretentious and not accessible to everyone. And so for my work, my personal work at cyber arts, in every aspect of my life, I'm trying to make it so that everyone feels like they can have these conversations like we're having now because we're all going through it. And so my work reaches, tries to do that um, by being silly and significant at the same time and bringing together individuals or individual moments with communities. I think also with technology, we are on our phones a lot by ourselves in our rooms. And so I think it's important to use technology to bring people outside and together. So the first project we're gonna look at is from almost six years ago. It's called Emo TinderCon. Um, I really like playing with words, so this was a fun title for me because we have emo, short for emotional, Tinder, popular dating application, emoticon, a digital icon or sequence of keyboard symbols that serves to represent a facial expression, and con, which is an instance of deceiving or tricking someone. The con will come back in the next project. So, um, <laughs> this is what it looked like, but essentially it was uh, 2014, Tinder was relatively new and emojis were relatively new. And so we were in this really interesting place where I remember people were still really um, didn't know what to think about Tinder. And we have these moments where a new application comes out and we question it. And then I feel like these moments last for a really small amount of time and then we stop questioning it. Much like Uber or Lyft. I remember when that first came out, I thought I would never get into a car with a stranger and now I use these applications all the time. So I wanted to create something in this moment where people were thinking about meeting up with a stranger and how creepy that could be or how exciting it could be. So I had just graduated from college. I was minoring in anthropology and I was also thinking about how Tinder could be this really kind of warped but interesting way to get a case study and see what different people were thinking about something at a given time. Obviously this is flawed and would not be used for actual research, but for art and for fun. So I knew I wanted to ask some kind of question or do something with this kind of group sample, but I didn't know what it was. So then I looked to emojis, which had blown up. People were using them all the time to communicate, but we were using them in this way where we were using them with words. So it was kind of this luxury where you're using words to communicate something and then you have this symbol that either strengthens what you're trying to say or maybe makes it more nonsensical. Do you think we are going to move to hieroglyphs again? Well, so that was kind of the impetus of the project was I was looking at hieroglyphs and seeing how this came full circle in such a fascinating way and was wondering whether because people were using them so much, wondering whether we would go to that and just only use images in the future and, or use images more than words. And do you have, like I do, like I'm sure we all do, do you have a list of the emojis that are missing? That you <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like castanets. Yes, yes. And I have a, another <laughs> full project that goes through that because yeah. it, it does get really political mm -hmm. because you're, yes. it's like a language and if you mm -hmm. don't see yourself and you, don't, you can't explain what you're mm -hmm. trying to communicate, with the set that's there, then that can cause some real issues. So that's what I wanted to explore exactly and see, okay, the good and bad parts of this. Like if we only were using images to communicate, that would make a more universal language, which is interesting. But then what kind of conversations can you have with only 270 characters? So this all came together in the form of an installation. It was really simple, really DIY. Um, we had a projector and it was set up to this iPad and you could only use emojis to communicate. Um, at that time I'd set it to only male because I didn't know how queer I was at that point. So all of these are just men. But um, we'll go through and you'll see if you go to the next slide. So, if you go back one, yeah, you can see how people, different people responded, but then there was this really special moment with um, Christopher. And so he said, also on my Tinder profile, I didn't have any pictures of my uh, face, so I had a mask on. So he said, I'm gonna assume all those, or what's going on behind the mask, random emojis. I'm gonna assume these are all emojis because I have a really shitty Android, 
blockity block, blickety blick. So then, I don't have a lot of time, so we're gonna kind of go through this, but he just starts talking about all the hot topics of the time. So we have Ukrainians in the UN, uh, he goes into net neutrality, um, if you go to the next one, talking about Warner and Comcast, Jesus, slow down. I don't mean to offend you, babe. Um, so who and, are we talking to online anyway? Exactly, exactly. And you can see kind of gradually as it goes on after the Time Warner Comcast, um, if you go back one, thank you. You can see, I say, okay, round of applause. Like this is pretty funny. And then if you go on to the next one, just keeps talking about all this stuff and basically is talking to himself. And then you have this hard eyes and then these emojis that really expressed how I was feeling at the time because it was like I can't, I literally will not allow myself to communicate with this person because I have to stick with the project. Oh and <laughs> so then he keeps going on. And then we started talking on August 9th. And then nine months later, <laughs> he got a new phone on March 9th and said, so I got a new phone where I can actually see the emojis and you totally thought I was charming. <laughs> so <laughs> that was just one outcome of this project. Um, but it really gets into these core concepts of, okay, if he hadn't updated his phone, what would have happened? And then you think about that in the larger scheme of things. If people don't have these updates, can I communicate with them with emojis? No. Okay, well, what if they can't get Tinder because they don't have an iPhone? Okay, well, then I might never meet them. And then you go in these different routes, and you're like, okay, if I meet someone on Tinder, and what if we get married, and what if we have kids, and what if we have a whole family? Of emojis. <laughs> of emojis. Or... What if the perfect person for you doesn't have an iPhone and you can't meet them online and then your life takes a completely different course? And then we can talk about like free will and fate and all this stuff, but this was a fun little project that again is silly and significant in different ways and looks at how, it can be, how we can communicate in funny ways with tech. Great. So we can go next. So um, um, we're going to buzz very quickly through yes. the next two things. Yes. But as a kind of like, uh, you know, a musgul right now, I want to ask all of you, what is the best part about working at the intersection of art and technology? I'll let one of you answer that first. <laughs> I like working at the intersection of art and technology because it, it feels so relevant. Mm -hmm. um, art always feels relevant to me, I think, but technology is really difficult, but we have to deal with it all the time. And I guess when I talk about one, they kind of relate to the other, so I feel like art is the same way. It's really difficult, but so important. Um, and I, I feel like the art that I make becomes more relevant when I use technology because it brings it into the present moment. Mm. What about you, Lani? Yeah, I like using technology because it's one of those things that like, we have it in the palm of our hand. Like We all have access to mm -hmm. it. And it's one of those things where um, I like being conscious of it in my work, but also challenging um, the approach so it's accessible. I try to always make it accessible in some way in just the way of like the presenting of it. But I also like to complicate that, so I think there's is something it, interesting in is that. Is it even correct to ask you know, whether about working with technology when it is so pervasive? Um, it's, it's like just, it's not even a medium anymore. It is the entire surroundings that envelop us. So, um, but it's still new. It's still mm -hmm. called new media. It's still even called new it's media. How yeah. old? I mean, technology itself is what as old as. But yeah. I think it's pretty humanity. exhausted, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. there's like the point yeah. where people just overwhelm, so they just like accept it, like we accept, like you know. But many artists work with all kinds of, of different technologies. You know, that go way beyond that go way beyond the digital. Um, yeah. They you know may work with you know like uh, I don't know city systems or um, things that we don't actually, data that we don't actually see. You work mm -hmm. with data we don't see. Yes. <laughs> well, I think we all do, like even your Tinder stuff. Mm -hmm. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's data, that's personal data that we're putting mm -hmm. in a database mm -hmm. and using right. in ways to connect to other people. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we're, we're still learning how to use it too. And that's mm -hmm. why I think it's important to have it part of my heart. Yeah, yeah I think practice. it's powerful too. Mm -hmm. and it's powerful to use it to, to discuss and bring up conversations that are hard or difficult or maybe considered as like old school mm. or old history. Mm. 
Okay, carry on now. Okay. What's your second All right, project? we'll go real fast. <laughs> I love this one. Okay, so this one also Lovely. has to do with Tinder. <laughs> um, we like Tinder. Yeah, so we can just play it and then I'll talk I'm over it. Tinder. Um, so fast forward a year, still making art, still weirdly using Tinder as my uh, medium of choice. And such a good sound. <laughs> <laughs> so I, like I was saying before, my Tinder profile didn't have any pictures of me on it. So it had, I was wearing a mask in one picture with a leotard. There was a picture of my hand in one. There was a picture of my art, a lot of pictures of my art, but never my face. And so um, <laughs> essentially, to make a long story short, one day I'm on Tinder and I get a notification that says that my account is going to be banned because it feels like spam, which was an insane feeling to me. And I, the more I thought about it, the more frustrated I got. And I thought, you know, who did someone say this or is this the AI? tracking me down and saying that I'm not working with this well, or who's, who's telling me that I feel like spam one? And so then I started researching it more and found out that someone had flagged my account. And once I figured that out, it got really dark in my head because you're on this application and most people are using it to find someone that they will love or hook up with or what have you. So if you're getting flagged for putting yourself online the best way that you know how and the way that you want to and the way that you want to express yourself and you're getting told that that feels like spam, that's a really disgusting feeling, honestly. So then I started researching spam, the word, where did it come from, and then was thinking more about this can of spam and what that actually feels like. So excuse me, so you're actually collaborating with people in this unintentional way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And so bringing it back to how we're communicating with humans and technology, like the last project was a really cute way of looking at that, and this is a really dark way of looking at it, where people are rejecting who you are, who you want to be online, and the fact that they can. And so this video just basically goes on and on about just, and the sound is really, disgusting and it smelled really weird <laughs> in the apartment when I was doing this and but essentially the point of this piece is to talk about um, who who can we be online if we can't be ourselves and all the things that happen behind this pane of glass that people wouldn't say that to me maybe in person but because they're behind this glass all they have to do is tap and then all these feelings of Discussed and all these questions come about. Right. So, and now you have something with lots of green swirls. Yes. <laughs> so that's what it looked like when I was reported. <laughs> Feels like spam. Inappropriate photos of your art, oh, yeah. of my art and my body and my like my hand. So this is. I'll just read two sections of this. Someone wrote this about the piece, and it said, she did not display the female body, she did not display the female face. The latter was cause for concern, the latter was cause for warning. That spam, the source of this undesirable sensation, may even feel the way her body feels. This body, pink, feminine, malleable, flaky, pungent, squishy, and acquired taste. So, there's more on that, but you get the idea. Okay, so the last one I'm going to talk about is green screen dreams. Um, this one I worked on this year and last year. No Tinder involved. Um, <laughs> after that last project, I said no more. So I, coming back to the human-to-human -human communications with technology, this was a project that I started because I was sick of working alone, which is what a lot of people who work with technology have to do. And art. And art, <laughs> both of them. So <laughs> went on a real lonely streak and decided that I wanted to collaborate with other people. At this time, I was working as the education coordinator at Cambridge Community Television, which is an amazing place. I can't say enough good things about it, but a really good place to come for creative people who are looking to express themselves through media. So I came up with this idea, or this question, and I asked 10 people that 
the day that I was at CCTV, what would you paint if you could paint anything? And nine out of 10 people responded and said, I can't paint. And I thought that's so interesting <laughs> that they, they're not even going there in their mind, but they're saying, no, I can't paint, so I can't answer this question. I can't even think about this question because I can't paint. So i had been doing a lot with green screening technology because I, I call it green screening technology. No one calls it that because it's not new and flashy, but I'm obsessed with it. I think it's this phenomenal idea where one color can change the background or essentially the reality that you exist within. So I wanted to do something with green screening. And so I went back to those same people and I said, I want you to come in and I want you to paint this canvas green, and then I'm gonna interview you and talk about what, if you could paint anything, and really think about it. You have all the painting abilities in the world. What would you wanna paint? So I had a couple different people. I think there were eight in total. This is them all posing with their art that they <laughs> did not wanna pose with. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can keep going. So you get all these really different designs, and for me, I, when I go into galleries and see paintings that are all one color, I, this is what I feel like. I'm like, it's interesting, it's cool, but I need more of a backstory. And, but these were all fascinating to me because everyone had these different strokes. And to me, these were already art, like done. They already created these magical paintings, but they didn't see it as that. So I was thinking, okay, how can I use technology to have them see what I'm seeing and to have them understand that they can be painters and that they are painters? And so, you can go back one. <laughs> so, then I recorded them all talking about their dreams and made these videos where I took out the green paint and put in photos and videos of what they had sent me, of anything they wanted to draw. Someone really wanted to draw aliens. Someone really wanted to draw warm, beautiful places because she was sick of living in the cold. It was winter time. So um, this is why you refer to your work as experiments. Yeah, mm -hmm, definitely, and I think Everything we do as humans is an experiment. I don't think there's right or wrong. I think we're all just trying to figure things out. So I try to use that word <laughs> a lot. Um, but the really cool part about this project was then they all came to the opening and we just, we had one TV with all the videos playing, but then we had the green paintings hung up in the gallery. And so for all intents and purposes, they were painters in this show. and. In the videos, I was able to make it look like they painted the thing, and that was cool to be able to change that reality. But this was so interesting because we were changing reality because these people who thought they couldn't paint at all then had their paintings hung in a gallery in Cambridge. And this is how you supplied a human connection. Exactly. Yes. yes. Cool. So that's the last one. May we, uh, <laughs> may we continue? Yes. Okay. We're going to talk about Christina Bouch. Um, who uh, is uh, a multidisciplinary artist, and um, we all are. Lives in, <laughs> you all are, and uh, and lives in Cambridge, and um, has. Um, I met her first at a show of selfies she's done. She did when, <laughs> and then her, she was looking like this and all of them. I said, this is very interesting. What is this? It was all like taken and all these pictures taken as she woke up every morning for a year. Um, and um, would you like to say a little bit more about what you do? Yes, sure. Uh, I'm, I'm an artist, obviously a multidisciplinary artist on this panel. I also curate, I will look at a couple shows I did this year at the Nave Gallery. Uh, and I'm also a... Oh, I'm going to just highlight that a moment because they were two oh, sure. amazing shows with 43 <laughs> different artists and she curated all of it. Uh, they were fabulous shows. I did not curate all of it. I well, she had two. <laughs> <laughs> you had two other people I doing it I had two co-curators for yes. the first show who, who made it mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Um, and I'm also a digital producer uh, in the marketing and technology space, which has taken me from a traditional artist place of drawing and painting and pulled me into this art and technology world that we're talking about now. Um, so that, that's been interesting. They layer in, in strange, strange ways. Um, so the, I'm going to go backwards in time. Um, my extensions work is the latest series that I'm, I'm working on. It's, it's um, a way for me to externalize my own 
body in a way that my my smartphone is. I, I, I read a book about, uh, we were talking about archives before this, um, and I, I was reading a book about digital archives and how that's changing, um, changing the way we save things and archive um, work and people, events and whatnot. <clears throat> uh, and I, I thought I want to be able to take control of that myself. Um, so what I started doing with this project is externalizing my own data. So I, I, I just started doing this last year. Um, the data sets that I've been working with so far are my heartbeat. I've done that one a lot. It felt like a good place to start because that's life, right? Um, if I don't have control <laughs> over my own heartbeat, what do I, what do I have control over? Uh, and then I looked into my text messages too, and just recently I've started um, exploring my medical records. Super exciting stuff, because <laughs> um, it's it's one of those things that we all have tons of data out there about ourselves, but but most people don't do much with it, or they do very little with it, but it's still out there being used all the time for other purposes, for commercial purposes. Um, again, I work in marketing, and people use data all the time to try to sell you more shit. <laughs> so I, I wanted to to take, take my data and, and visualize it. Um, so my heartbeat is, it's also fun, because, um, it's such a, it's such a recognizable um, sound and visual, even though none of us really see our own hearts beat, but we still know the sound and what it looks like. So this is a 3D printed heart. Um, I made this at Artisans Asylum, by the way. So mm -hmm. I, I made a 3D printed heart with um, the help of a member here. Um, and I also recorded my heartbeat and put it in this uh, it was called a circuit playground. I started working with electronics through this series, which has been a lot of fun. Again, starting it here at Artisans Asylum in the electronics department. Um, this this piece was uh, the first one I did. It's called Extension Zero One Zero Zero One. So I, I named them like a like I named my files. So I, I wanted to be. I really wanted to be a data set. You know, I know it doesn't look like that, but I still want it to feel that way. So this one, my heartbeat is in there as well. It's that little circle in the middle. Um, but this one's more of a portrait too. So I have my, my portrait on the smartphone in there. And then that's my hair in the background. Um, it's actually a cyborg. So it's human, machine, and animal. How do you decide um, whether to do stuff in the physical realm or the digital realm? Uh, that's a good question. I, I tend to, even for this project, but in most of my art, I tend to just start drawing and making stuff physically anyway. Um, but again, I, I, I still want to move into that digital realm mm -hmm. because it feels like it feels like it's where I should go, even though it's not where I want to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I have another question too. Data sure. is only ever partial, and it's only yes. as good as whatever the analysis of it is or the tool used to collect it. Yep. So how do you account for that in your portrayal using it? Well, the, what I like about um, using data in this way, in a visual, artistic way, is that it, it's okay for it to be so um, piecemeal. And, and compartmentalized. So I've, you know, I've taken my heartbeat and done different things with it. Um, in a, it's not in a similar way, but I feel the same way about um, our digital selves online. So again, in, in my marketing world, we, we all have our um, personal brands, right? <laughs> That's a very common term now. But we have it in different ways. So we have the one for our friends and the one for our family. And we don't want those two to cross, so we keep them separate. And then you have one for work on LinkedIn, you know, all these different profiles and, and versions of yourself online. And I, I like to take my data and do that in a way um, with these extension pieces. They're all little mm -hmm. pieces 
this is a little bit like Lynn Leeson and her. This is a little bit like Lynn Leeson and Leeson and her three Robertas. Lynn Hirschman Leeson. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love her her work. She she did a a series decades ago. You know, before this sort of technology was around, where she she created this alter ego called Roberta, and who had a like credit card and a bank account and, and psychiatric you know, records and everything yeah, it was she, like it was the, Roberta should... and Lynn went to separate <laughs> psychiatrists uh, and then more recently still she, not uh, and then she made a digital version of herself well then right? yeah then she made cyber Roberta right which is a doll if you saw the ICA Boston show um, art in the age of the internet it was there and you could you could move it you could go on your phone and like control its head and, and it could watch people um, so I, yeah, I love Lynn Hirschman Leeson's work, um, and I, I like the way she she portrays herself in different ways. Um, well, that was actually a totally different character. So I'm not doing that. This is actually um, my own data, and mm. I, I tag it with my own name, like it's mine. Um, but I, I like to I like to show the different facets. So this is a, a digital piece that I did. It's it's a on a web page. It's it's a drawing. It started out as a drawing, and then I I coded it, um, and I love that it still looks like a drawing, uh, and my heartbeat is still there in the middle. Um, so this this is it's a this is a digital version of the physical sculpture that I made, um, which I don't. I don't necessarily want to have physical and digital versions. I'd like to have just digital versions too. But I, I still like to have that human touch so it doesn't look so digital. So I still have that drawing element in it. Um, yeah, so those you, are my you have, uh, you have a lot of data exposed and available to people, to people now. What do you feel about the privacy issues? Involving data. Uh, I, I feel like privacy issues, data privacy is a hot topic, and I, th I think it's a hot topic, but only for people who really understand it, and I, most people still don't care. You know, they're like, whatever, as long as I get Tinder for free and Facebook for free, I, you know, they can have all my data. But of course, the more, the more the layers are being pulled back, we're seeing how they're actually using our data, how we've agreed for them to use our data, which is probably the scariest part. Um, and we're realizing, wait a minute, I think that's too far. Uh, but they're like, nope, we're already going, sorry, we, we're just gonna keep taking, 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 and selling, selling, selling. So I think it's, it's something that, again, I'm trying to take more control over it and have more awareness of it by, collecting my data, which can be time consuming because it's not easy, uh, and then visualizing it in a way that I, uh, visualizing it in a way that is something that I like, <laughs> which is a very vague statement, but, but there's, there's no real rules to the project except that I'm externalizing a piece of my own data. Uh, and I've done, I've done some more work with text messages um, just kind of digging into my text message history and again drawing it because I, I don't love the way digital clean design lines is. I still want it to be hand drawn, so I'll do that a lot. Um, do you know Brian Kane's project where he's taken his um, digital database and inscribed it on granite? <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, I think we talked about that, and I, yeah. I th all I could think in my head was. Where the hell is he going to store all that stuff? Because <laughs> it's. I think it's a project on one of the out islands in Boston or something like yeah. that. Oh right, yeah, yeah. So so I love that the the idea of your drive making being granite. your taking your digital data, which is meant to be so compact and you know easy to transport and send and and then making it tangible Com and physical and heavy and I, completely I really like unusable and, and unwieldy. completely useless. Which is what most of it is anyway. There's yeah. so much data about each of us out there, and 95% of it is not being used, but it's out there. And so let's, somebody could take it and use it at any time. Let's look at the next image with the, uh, some, with the Nave show yeah, here. Yeah, so, so avatars stemmed from, also stemmed from this idea of digital memory and um, our digital selves online. 
on how we as artists represent ourselves in different ways. So I, I, I curated two shows at the Nave Gallery um, just down the road. One is Avatar's Ghosts, and there were a lot of different artists in this show. Um, this is Rachel Chatil, X-Ray Ames, and Julia Checo. Um, this, the show, uh, I curated it with Juliana Funkhauser and Krista Wright, who are in San Francisco. Uh, it really opened my eyes to all the different ways that technology and the way we represent ourselves now in the age of technology. <laughs> It, it's really um, how varied it is. So, I mean, like there's Julia's piece here um, as Tom, uh, be on a cell phone, it's a video. Uh, she, that's more of an obvious use of technology, but, but then the work by X-Ray and Rachel, I, I found a lot of ties to technology too that I, I wasn't expecting, and I, I love that, you know, X-Ray's work, um, X-Ray actually, Pierce's um, a collaborator's skin, and there's a, a string connecting the physical structure with that person, and then with X-ray with them actually doing that work of tying and connecting. Um, and I really, it it I I don't know if X-ray would describe their work this way, but I immediately thought it's so. Uh, it's so much like the internet, where we're just constantly making these ties um, with with ourselves and with other people and with other places. Um, and then Rachel's work on the is the kind of tree-looking piece there. Um, this is in reference to a historical past. Um, there's I, I won't get into it, I think. But uh, and then the second show was called Avatar's Futures, and that was. More, more technology, more new media, as we call it. Um, although this, this is a giant painting here. Um, so it, it's that's by Tony Stone. Yes, Tony yeah. Stone, who's, who's also in Somerville here. Um, and this was a big video and um, uh, installation by uh, A. Marcel. So the this work was it's a it's a way for me to to learn from other artists how they represent themselves online and, and in, in this digital, digital age and how they explore their own identity and, and kind of society's identity. Like how is our society changing? Which is part of Tony's work here where you see um, giant robot avatars. You know, it, a, lot of it, a lot of it was kind of post-apocalyptic which I think is appropriate, <laughs> uh, but it was it was a lot of fun to explore those topics with mm. with these forty other very talented artists. I have a question for Keaton, which I then want you and you to answer, and that is, you worked a lot with the digit digitization of stuff, files, and so forth like that. Um, and um, how can you answer how that affects how we communicate with each other? Well, I think it first impacts the way we remember things mm -hmm. more yeah. than anything. I think the way we archive everything and have everything accessible, it makes our brains less quick to remember. And so, and then you also get into the situation where looking back on images or photographs change your original memory as well. So I think in a connective way, I think humans, we are our memories and our relationships are memories also. So mm -hmm. when you're relying on this data, it comes to the point where the data is what kind of defines the relationship and... And it changes how you construe yourself and, and look at the how relationship. You, how you're, and your identity. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. if you, I have a lot of people who with the text messages, you can see all the photos that you've sent back and forth and it mm -hmm. becomes this really interesting kind of woven imagery woven together of your conversations, mm -hmm. but then that also changes, you know, you don't see the arguments that you had with that, or mm -hmm. you don't see, and pictures always are more positive normally than they are documenting the negative things. So mm -hmm. I think that translates to how we look at our relationships and mm -hmm. ourselves mm -hmm. also. Yeah. So now I want you to answer that question too. The digitization mm. 
of yeah how that how oh, that changed of just our our data mm -hmm. yeah i i think it's it's changed the way we um the way we communicate the mm -hmm. way we identify ourselves um i think at first on the with the internet it was a way to like explore these other identities and and ways of being that we wouldn't normally feel comfortable doing in real life but but now now that the internet and social media and technology, that, that technology has been around for a while, it's starting to be regulated in a way, like with your feels like spam, where you can't do that now. So I think it's, it was this like place of freedom where you could do so much and now it's being pulled back a little bit. Opposite. Yeah, so Keaton, you talked about how it changes yeah, the past and our history. Lani, you are really um, concerned with the past and history and how it's been changed. And yeah, well, I mean, I think it's interesting because I, I feel the opposite of that. I feel oh, really? Like, yeah, because I mean, the way I use like files on the internet um, is like, that's actually my first source of research yeah. about like my own history, like my family in Hawaii and yeah. you know, being a Pacific Islander, like what is, like what's our identity? Like how are we present? And a lot of times I, I don't see that we are. And if, if there is um, information, a lot of it's either misinformed or it's like really edited in a certain way, like what lens is being used. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of like um, access now, like people, um, you know, there's people who didn't have access that, before yeah. can now have a voice. Right. So mm -hmm. it's like interesting to see now the the different like um, articles or different like you know conversations that are being had. Like even right now in Monacoa, like the, right now there's like the the volcano versus like the you know 30 millimeter telescope. There's like that yeah. whole. There's like just on Twitter alone, you know, there's a huge conversation going on, which yeah. is really interesting that wasn't there before. Well, we're going to move back to that in a moment, but we're going to yeah. move on to the next the final uh, yep. uh, yeah. piece so of the, yours. Yeah, um, so the last thing I want to show is just the AWAKE project that Jessa mentioned. This was this was my first foray into a more digital practice. Um, I took a, a selfie in the morning right when I woke up for, I actually did it for a few years, um, and it's, it was a way for me to see myself in a different way that I wouldn't have been able to do without the, the smartphone technology. So I, um, I, I like that sometimes, you know, it's like normally you wouldn't post photos of yourself looking so groggy and like swollen when you wake up. Um, and I, I found it was a really um, introspective way, but, but publicly, because I posted all of these to Instagram and, and a website. So to be introspective and kind of get to know myself a little better and be comfortable with my, my physical self, but also to do it in a public way. Um, and these are digital files or digital, they're shown digitally, but they're also shown physically. I, I put them, I print them out and show them in gallery as well. Um, and then I started drawing emojis on them, like this is what I felt like, but this is, you know, this is what I looked like, but this is what I really felt like. Um, so it's been a fun way to kind of, I can keep playing with those images for a long time, and I, I have been. I've done a lot of experiments with these images, which has been fun. And there's also a, a tradition now of using insufficient images in art that have, you know, do not subscribe to uh, the perfection at all. Yeah, and a lot of these are really grainy and mm -hmm. low resolution because I, I take it right when I wake up. So a lot of times, you know, it's it's not in focus, and I don't see what I'm doing. And that that's part of the point. I, I want it to be um, as uncurated as possible. And it 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 was is yeah. uh, is, is Hito Steirl an influence in this because of her. Uh, in this work, yes, I guess um, her most of her writing, I think, would be more influential. She writes a lot about images online and how they keep getting repurposed and copied and pasted and cut and cropped and you know sent here and sent there and to the point where the image that most people see is totally different than the original image. Um, original image, whatever that means, because now images are digital. And they're immediately, you know, messed with. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, her her writing on imagery and the sort of 
democratization of, of media and images through the internet was influential for this, yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, we're gonna go to Lani. Lani Asuncion. Hey. Hi. Hi. So, um, dear me, where's my introductions? Start yourself with an introduction, I'll catch up. Um, I am also a multimedia artist. <laughs> Seems to be the hot, hot, hot commodity of our, our being. Um, I like to commun like, uh, community organize. I organize things. I like to bring people together and uh, have fun events on rooftops in Cambridge, things like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just pop up in a park and start making music with plants. Um, do you have any hot rooftop events coming up? I do, <laughs> Good I question. do, on Tuesday, yo, 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 you gotta be there, you all should come, it will be fun, yes, please, please show up, come through, um, so, it's going to be at Studio 550, Ooh. So storytelling is at the heart of your practice? Sometimes, yeah, pretty and, much, all the time. Um, you <laughs> <laughs> and you deal with experiences of loss, experiences of loss and transformation? Yeah, those are big words that kind of like bring it together, but... And belonging? Yeah, like how do we belong as mm -hmm. like who's a we and what is us? And, and because you're multicultural and biracial, you pull all this into the picture as well? I do, and sometimes it's very multi-layered and that's why I think media is a good platform because mm -hmm. I can bring a lot of that kind of conversation in a way where people can watch it and not be totally like bombarded and or intimidated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you use nature um, in your work, actual and yeah, and processed. that word nature to me is like so loaded. So, so I yeah. kind of want to unpack that um, literally onto my lap. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, um, when I graduated from UConn, I focused a lot in um, video and performance. Um, I come from a background of fine arts of painting and sculpture and printmaking. Um, so I was really trying to figure out like what is video and like what does that mean to me? Um, when I was doing my thesis work, I was thinking a lot about um, Andrei Tchaikovsky, the um, Russian uh, director, um, you know, the guy who did Solaris and Mir and Stalker, um, and like, what was it to use video in a way where it was like slow and like, what is Western or Eastern time, like literally, like, what does that mean like culturally, and how do we break that down in media? Um, so I had all these like theories like running around in my head, and I was like, well, how do I actually like, do that in my work? Um, so I had my first residency in Troy at Contemporary Art Center, and I had access to this whole church. Um, so if you go forward and you go ahead and start playing the video. Um, next slide. And so this video is called Bloodless, um, and I was in a church, um, and I was trying to figure out, like, what do I do in this church? It was creepy, it was dark, it was awesome. And I found a hibiscus plant, uh, and we can just turn down the volume. And so I, basically kind of thought about what is the loaded imagery that I could communicate, because all imagery has language. Um, and that's where the storytelling comes in. And the hibiscus for me was something that was very loaded because there's one point, um, my family's from Hawaii, my father grew up on a um, sugar plantation, the one that Dole started um, a long time ago um, in the 1980s, that then eventually like led to the annexation of Hawaii. Um, and I'll unpack that in a little bit. Um, but I was really interested in how this one plant is kind of like symbolized, like people associate it with Hawaii. Um, and the actual um, state flower is a yellow hibiscus, but it looks very similar to the red one, and it's actually very different. And the red one is not native, and the other one is. So, so you're using these to unpack your cultural identity then? Yeah, and so some people might understand that maybe, and some people might not, which is fine. They don't have to know all of it, but I think the feeling still comes through, and the complex conversations still come through. Um, and a lot of my works, I work in series. So like if it's installed, and I work in installations, I work in space. Um, so even if it's like a gallery, I still think of it as an environment, um, something that can still be like, um, like you'd walk into a garden or something, like still has pieces, like you see the different flowers and they all like say something. In this case, um, you know, I'm crashing the flower into my crotch. And all those actions, they all like kind of like build up into a story that is, um, it's a very painful, a complex story. One of the things I like about your work is that it's somewhat pedagogical, but uh, it uses this real time aspect you've talked about so that you feel the changes happening. You don't just understand them intellectually, you feel them interiorly. Right, and that's why I love Tchaikovsky's work because he did a thing where 
you know, and it pissed people off. They were like, oh my God, this is so long. What the hell? But there was something powerful in like, like kind of commanding that attention, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like, like real time. What is real time? Like in video, like this is like not real time because I'm cutting it, right? So every cut is like a different moment in time. And then what is it to cut the frame in half? And so that's how I was using the actual like technical aspects of the video to create like that tension, that pain that existed within that, that story and that timeline. Um, so Bloodless um, was like the quote unquote war that happened right before um, Dole and his business partners and apparently um, the Boston Naval um, fleet that came over to kind of back them up um, asked uh, the queen at the time, you know, to step down, uh, Lydia Kamehameha, um, to step down. And it's just interesting to me, um, just like how do I express all of that in imagery? And how do I, you know, there's like connections within my own histories, but how do I portray that in like two minutes or six minutes? Um, and a lot of this actually is pretty long because the actions are still happening. Um, but that's when I brought it into post and just started like literally cutting it up, and it did feel really aggressive. And so it was really interesting to kind of experiment with that. So this sort of this brings up sort of like one of those big questions, like you know, so what is reality here? How important is it? Uh, which is I'm going to ask the rest of you. How does how does digital um, working in the digital realm uh, both create the reality of being human and also rip it apart? You mentioned. Uh, the part about looking at all those photographs as a way of seeing only a small element of reality such that the rest might be forgotten. You have a long timeline that includes everything, seemingly. Sometimes. Sometimes. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think it's actually really important. I had a professor once said, you know, Lonnie, you use that weird sound, that really weird stuff. But a lot of it's just straight up, like, like the trucks that were passing by behind me on that I did it right by the interstate. Um, and it was important to kind of have that real, to like bring the viewer back into reality, mm -hmm. um, but also that kind of like industrial, to like reference back to this kind of like hard truth of like the environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. I think just the world right now feels very surreal. And so I think working digitally is just a really easy way to match that feeling. Like any science article or <laughs> there's new articles every day that make me feel like I'm in a weird dream world and I feel like you can, if our reality is changing this much, and if I don't know what reality means in the most normal, understood version of reality, then I can use that in my art to bring up these questions by shifting it. You can move the next one. And this is at, uh, that was at Boston Cyber Arts that Keaton well. curated. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that was in Body Mass. That was a really awesome show. Yeah, it was cool. It's good. Um, so on that note, I mean, Keaton really hit a good point. That's what I realized was missing in the work, the video work. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Just for you, was the performance of Bloodless more important than the video, or the equivalent? So I'm about to talk about that. Good That's question. like a great. You're like we're, we're, you're you're so on it. That's awesome. <laughs> like we're we're like together on this. So what I realized is my body was missing. Like I realized like. I kept putting my body in. Like I even created a character called Pineapple Girl, which I did two years before. I did that performance in the church privately. And so the private performances had power and I was able to like portray that. But the kind of need for cutting, that need for like doing something more digitally, kind of told me that there was something lacking. And what that was was the immediate confrontation and or hopefully like communication and or interaction with the viewer. So this was done at the MFA. Um, it was opening for um, a screening that was called Nar Nar Narcissister, um, which is a really awesome, really great feminist um, artist. She's all the things. Um, and I was really honored to be able to perform this kind of before um, a screening, which I really liked that it was paired with like video again. And also the video is very complex with the way it's like performative in its video and whatnot. Um, and this actually became really emotional for me. And it was interesting because like how I can see all of you, I couldn't see anybody because it was so bright, the light. Um, and I usually had a live performer that would perform the music, which I'll play in a little bit, which is um, the song that the queen um, wrote later, um, Aloha Oi, which became a very popular song in Hawaii and I deconstructed it. Um, so 
it was really interesting to actually like perform this and perform this more every time I did it live, I realized how more and more that power was kind of um, present, but also how um, it opened it up for um, the complex level of the viewer and the um, like there's an energy, there's a transference there that I can't, I can't actually have when it's just a video. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is, in a way, your, yeah. this is a method of collaboration as well. Yeah, it might take mm -hmm. a little bit of time. We can, let's just move forward. So that's the original song. You can look up the original song, as you can see it's on the interwebs. Um, I also <laughs> performed this. So I'll play the song that was um, actually played live by Piotr Sapinziansky, <laughs> and he's right there on the right side. And so we played it on a ukulele that was being played through a doom amp, and it was being then deconstructed by creating um, a detuning every single loop. So if we go ahead and play it right there, you'll start to kind of hear the song. And it's interesting, because like in the first um, time this was done digitally, um, we, we did it live in a church at Hope Church in JP. Um, so there's something kind of interesting that happened um, with the song kind of resonating within a real church and um, projection mapping kind of like what I actually like, like had a digital image of the hibiscus that I was deconstructing physically, tearing apart. So what I usually do is I <clears throat> I beat the hibiscus into my lap and then I tear it apart um, leaf by leaf and, and uh, flower by flower and then I replant it and it grows back again. Um, and the growing back part is something that like I live with and that not like mm -hmm. the, the viewer itself, they don't really get to see, but there's like time in that. Um, and I also deal with projections, live projections. So um, I'm really interested in that. How does like the digital um, interact with like the physical? Now you've also done other interesting things with sound, like taking the growing cycle energy of a plant and pushing it through a, a MIDI thing to yeah. form. Yeah, we can move to that. Um, human garden. Stuff, yeah. yeah, so the human garden. So we can go right back really, really quickly. Um, oh, oh. And go back? Yeah, we're going way too quick. Oh, um, it's okay. <laughs> Um, so I, um, when I moved here two years ago, almost two and a half years ago, soon to be three, oh God, um, I walked by every day the landmark building in Fenway, do you know that fancy park that's up right now, with those really strange uh, sculptures that I think geese really like a lot, which I think is really interesting how the geese have taken over that park in, in a really kind of empowering way. Um, so I used to walk by when they would have the construction fence and it was like this fake and I would pull a piece off every time and stick it in my pocket or my bag. And I was just kind of mad about how much um, like chemical waste was being kind of like brought into the sewer system and how much like it was just like awkward to walk around. I actually um, communicated a few times with the people who were like the construction heads. And I was like, can I, can I, can you, will you donate some of this fake plant to my project? I was like, I'd love to like, you know, kind of like interact with this, what's happening here. And they were just like, oh, like stop bothering us. Like it's gonna take two years. And I was like, I can wait that long. And they just like, they never, they just didn't really, uh, they didn't really run on to that. Um, but it was really interesting to me just kind of watch this development. You can play that. And so I had a residency at Vermont Studio Center, um, which is awesome because residencies allow you to kind of like get lost in your work and like kind of be disconnected from the real world for a little while. Um, but while I was there, I started kind of playing around with the imagery of uh, the landmark building. And I wanted to kind of like do this kind of wonky. I like dealing with technology where it's like one layer, one base to another. So I um, filmed myself on the projection and then played it back. So I'm not actually on that wall, but that's a, that's a, like a video of me performing. And then it's like a really wonky kind of after effects like animation of like, you know, growing in a very opposite way, like more like a curtain than it is an actual growing. Um, so this actually kind of like started my whole exploration um, with like what does it mean to be connected to green spaces and how do um, corporations or how do people who have power and or access to land, what, what is land ownership, how do they construct these spaces, how do they use them as ponds to create then um, 
like to have access to, you know, put up a whole block of office buildings um, instead of living spaces. Um, so there's a lot of politics involved, and I feel like it's really tied to the the things that were going on in Hawaii and Bloodless. So to me, the connections are there. Um, and so if you go forward a little bit, um, I started doing this piece called Human Garden. So that's what this is titled. And I started doing also these workshops called Biosounds. Um, so. It's where I take a biosensor, a MIDI sprout. Um, I'm using a very like basic one that I bought from this guy in Cambridge. I picked it up in like a, a flea market. I bought it off eBay. It was really rad. I was like, man, I love I love Boston. I can just like get something somebody made at MIT. I was like, I don't have to buy it in Germany. So I needed one for this workshop. And I ended up doing a live performance in Ramler Park, which is like right next to where that development happened. But this park has native plants, and the volunteers who volunteer there have been volunteering for like five or eight years. And the woman, uh, Frankie, gave me a tour, and she showed me all the different local plants. And if you go there, there's a little teeny piece of paper. I should have put that up. And it says, it like maps all the like native plants, and it tells you about them. And so it was really rad to like, I just got a permit from the city, and I like chucked out $150 and I got PAs. And I asked my friend to come down, my friend Sean um, from Philly. Um, and he, oh, we together performed um, with these plants. So the biosensors connect to the plants. I'm connecting it to a synth and um, his sound system. He had a little synth. Um, and we were basically taking the energy patterns from the plant and then turning that into music. Um, and now you do biosound workshops too. Yeah, I did it at the Boston Children's Museum, and kids are like so rad. They have a lot of patience and care for plants. The only time I ever had to tell somebody, I'd be like, whoa, be careful, you're gonna hurt the plant, was like somebody's dad. And I was like, as I did, you can't pull it like that, you're gonna like hurt it. And so the sensors are like, they're just little um, EKG like sensors, they're like sticky. And so, um, this is like a young person like messing with it there. And Can you say a little bit more about how this brings awareness to environmental issues? Yeah, so the way that the sensors work is like conductivity. So there's a negative and positive connection. Um, so it's really nice because I can tell people, like young people, their parents, like all of us, that you know there's energy and connectivity within plants and there's also that happens with us and there's a connection there. Um, and then if you move forward a little bit and um, there's also ways that like, we can control that um, and thinking maybe more about how, how can we use technology to, con to connect more with plants and how do we just in general connect to them. So I try to, as I do these workshops, have those conversations, have that kind of roll around. What and are actually, some of the answers that you came up with? Um, well, the kids are like, this is cool, and they really like it. Um, and parents are just like, this is science. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's science. And, and they're like, it's art. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's art too. And we're just like, had these conversations of just getting excited about art and science and like mm -hmm. just making music with plants mm -hmm. and that we can do it together because the conduct, like you have to like have a congruent like chain, right? So there's ways to like connect to the plant and connect to each other. And I can actually have it to like, if I hold your hand and you hold mine, we would have a connected current and then if we let go, it would be broken. So I want to do more <laughs> workshops where like, there could be like, just communal, like, basically people playing in the park and holding each other's hands, which is like, something that we like, miss, right? Yeah, and it's like, how do we get people to do that more in a way that um, is just natural or even just brings up thinking or just makes them feel kind of good and they just go home and they're like, oh, that was nice. You know? But it's like just having that feeling, that kind of connectivity and that that play and just that thinking, it doesn't always happen because we just get so used to, you know, being in a park that was made for two years or something. It's amazing that you were able to do that with technology. Yeah. To bring people together to hold hands. Just to play. And play with plants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, that's all I want. But it's, <laughs> parents brought their kids because it's STEM. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. 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 Uh. <laughs> man <laughs> but it works right yeah and so I kind of like I have that humor like this is the first time like doing to me this is the most accessible project that I've done in the sense where I could kind of connect all like even my humor and kind of like bring it in because the other stuff is so heavy it hurts I have to step back from it for a while because it just hurts it's just like sorry can I say on, on? okay <laughs> I mean it's that painful and then so when you're doing this it's like oh wow like 
Like I had one of the people who were working at the museum, they started crying because they didn't expect it. They didn't know what they were walking in on. And I was just yeah. like, they're just like, oh, the kids are so happy and they're connecting to like the plant that sits in the corner most of the time. Yeah. And people overwater it or something, you know, because they don't really know how to connect to it. So the digital world is not so impersonal as we might think. Right. Mm. Yeah. And I've had people say to me, well, you know, who've grown up with computer screens, this is an intimate space. The pixels are intimate. Um, and I hadn't really thought of it that way before, but um, but yeah, yeah, it can be a little teeny biosensor that somebody just you know used a little teeny breadboard with a couple you know transistors and you know a couple like sensors or whatnot. Just bring it out to a MIDI feed, and there you go. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, great. And right now, the I do have this piece still up at the Boston Children's Museum. It's um, this one I called Handmade um, because children walk up to this pedestal that it has a, it's like a little fake grass mound um, and it has a leap motion which is used for video games and it's like basically it's an extravagant an inverted or ex inverted um, mouse sensor um, that also kind of works like a connect camera from your Xbox. Um, and repairing it, I worked with uh, Chris Konopka, who um, helped me um, program it through Max, and uh, helped me make a um, patch that um, basically um, took all the extreme, like you're talking about information, like when you have data, it can be overwhelming. So it yeah. just basically like kind of funnels the data into um, a motion, like a, something that picks up the motion of the children's hands. So we probably have children, like, I mean, I heard somebody like, some, some kid like stood on it, was like gorilla tapping it. And you know, we have like kids that bring them like hand action. And so we had to like control that a little bit and still make it so that um, like the intention would control the video in the way that I as an artist wanted it to, but also in a way that would like communicate to the children like something's happening. So when they move their hand over it, it will either bulge if they move this way, it will twist if they do this, it will like, if you, you kind of like, it can twist a little bit if you do things like that. So it really works good with like little children hands. Um, adult hands is a little tricky and you, it really do have to kind of like have it visible because it is still a camera and a sensor. Um, but it's kind of beautiful because it was a simple way for me to communicate to young people that we can control our environment and there's ways to have fun with it, but it also can be very detrimental and kind of like it can, you know, when they move their hand like this, it crunches it up like a ball. And um, what does that mean, you know, conceptually and what does that mean in general? So, so. that this technological connection overall though looks hopeful. Yeah, I hope so. And, yeah. and what about a lot of this is nature in an urban environment. What do you have to say about that part? Um, it is, but, like this piece was really nice because it actually was in the Arboretum. Um, so it was like, and I picked ferns on purpose um, and it's like a tilt shift lens. So I got really close and it was like kind of animating this, like turning this very small um, environment into a very big one. Um, and also kind of bringing the children into a, a world. Um, but it was nice to kind of work local and mm -hmm. it was nice to bring like a, like kind of one side of the city into another side of the city and another side of the city like in the Boston Children's Museum in the area where it's like extremely gentrified. And there's like, you know, like how do these two places think about each other? What is the land saying to each other? Like, like do we know how, like are there, are there like spores that move? Like does one part get to grow in another part? Um, I know that's where my brain goes. <laughs> but I, I was really excited to kind of bring that in and to bring like parts of plants that are kind of ancient um, that we kind of overlook because you're like, ferns, those are cheap in the store. You know, it's like that's not a, you know, a orchid or something like that. And I love orchids, they're my favorite. But it's just kind of thinking about like, um, I don't know, just kind of again, like making something that's simple, kind mm -hmm. of special mm -hmm. and like asking for that to be mm -hmm. focused on. Mm. I want to step back and ask a general question of all three of you. Um, so there was this uh, social media week conference in New York City that um, uh, and I read a uh, HuffPost article about and apparently the main takeaway from it was how important it was for brands and marketers to quote, deliver the human experience <laughs> because of how alienating and how fake everything really is. Let's try and make it so fake that people believe it, yeah. you know? <laughs> what do you think of that? I think it's a great um, reality versus uh, virtual reality 
versus what people want us to believe. I, I think it, it, it goes back to uh, Keaton likes to talk about reality. <laughs> And if it's, it's real. Dark. <laughs> but it's what interesting, I, though, though, because the marketing firms are the groups that are driving all of this development. It's, um, uh, and is, are they the legitimate people to do this? Though? Of I think course they are. not. <laughs> <laughs> they think they are. But I so, think they, they're, they're trying to construct a reality mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for, for people to fight back. Yeah. I mean, some of it is not so bad. Uh, there are some brands that I, I like what they do, and, mm -hmm. and I like their reality for lack Well, of but we're constructing our own brands online, too. I mean, with, you know, right. our different personas. Yeah, I mean, I was marketing this event all yep, week. Yep, exactly. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, but it's interesting to hear it in a, in a conference where people were probably paying, like, a few thousand dollars to get a few this, thousand dollars to go this to important, and be obvious told information. That they need to be more human on the right. internet. Right. You know, mm -hmm. um, and and what does it mean when when a commercial entity is doing that? You know, and that mm. of course can go back to like corporations are people and right. um, people are are data online <laughs> <laughs> that can be commodified. And I, I think it's 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 a I can quickly go down a black hole mm -hmm. with that conversation where where advertising and and because um, you've worked in advertising yeah, yeah. and I, I and have I have to go marketing. down that black hole it works <laughs> but it, it's still it's it's I, I I do want people and I think about kids mm -hmm. and and this advertising and I want people to be more aware of how how people are trying to, how businesses are trying to construct this reality for us online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's use this as a pivot to move on to looking at some, uh, talking about some other artists who do mm. work of this sort. Um, and um, we have a person here that we've mentioned before, Hito Steirl, mm -hmm. um, who did a piece called Liquidity Inc., which was basically about the breakdown, the destruction of the of uh, the commercial world. Do you want to mention anything about this piece or her work? Uh, this piece was also at the ICA for a little while mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's a lot about, I think it, it brings in that idea of reality because um, mm -hmm. she, she sort of mimics a news, um, like a breaking news clip. Uh, so she's German and she's very aggressive in her presentations. She has a complex and, background, and really. she do, she does yeah. have a complex yeah. background, yeah. Um, mm. But but this in this piece a lot you see it's there's a lot of like there's a map and I think she's talking a lot about climate change too mm. and like weather and politics and but it's in a way that's really difficult to understand and it's disconnected and in my mind very much like our, our experience online when we're trying to. I don't know, do something on the internet, and we, we're so disconnected in what we do. I actually mm -hmm. saw her speak at Yale, and that yeah, was a bit, yeah, that was like kind of intensely life-changing for me a little bit, Yeah. in the moment of where I was She's doing my intense. work, or like work changing, mm -hmm. um, in the sense that like she, so it was at Yale, and she kind of created like, she was like dismantling the the talk, so she was like, mm. she was like, this is not academic, but it was academic, but it wasn't. Yeah. So like, I was actually really amazed mm. by how she was able to kind of like, not punk the system, but there was just something kind of like really interesting, and like I just I I didn't know her work well enough at the time, and then once I knew that, I like got all the books and I read her book. Yeah. She's um, very academic, yeah, and I think for a lot of people maybe inaccessible, yeah. but she uses very normal everyday things yeah. in her work. Yeah, mm -hmm. it it was just really interesting to like kind of experience that, and I was like, wow, this is why performance is so like powerful, yeah. and how amazing it is. Like even in her like she's like always on even when yeah. she was giving the talk that was like mm. our piece. Right. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. we have Joan Jonas. Yeah, yeah. she's here. <laughs> I, so I really like Joan Jonas. I, when I first learned about her work, it was about the mirror yeah. piece that she did. And um, she's been around for a while. Honey. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, no, she had people in the park that had mirrors on oh. them. And, I've always been really interested in mirrors and video as two different ways of seeing one thing. And like with a mirror, you can smash it and it'll still show 
bits of what's happening around you, but with a camera, if you smash it, it will break. <laughs> so, but with a camera, you can fast forward and pause and stop and rewind time, and with mirrors, it's just showing you exactly what it is. So I think, especially with mirrors and looking at reality and not being able to record something, it's just this very interesting way of seeing what's right in front of you. And to have people walking around with mirrors that show you what you're looking at, but it's through this completely different perspective because it's not what you're looking at. I think mirrors are just really good non-technical ways to talk about reality mm. also. Mm. And I like the way Joan Jonas, she's very much multidisciplinary mm. and uses performance yeah. and video. And, and she uses a, lot of, uses a lot of props and mediated yes. images. Mm -hmm. I, I, I find that, the way she does that That's really, really powerful. Uh, inspiring. Yeah, Sonia Wolfolk. Who else we got? Sonia Wolfolk. Yeah. yeah. So, do you guys know her work? Yeah, it, it's so it's called Afrofuturism, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't, I guess, get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then Paddocks is like the um, first series of creating a, a world that she made up. Mm -hmm. um, and be, took the role as an uh, anthropologist. I wish we had more pictures. And, um, it was all female as a world, um, and they had evolved to connect, um, g like genetically connect to plants. So she has like this whole series that, um, that she was doing, I think, at Chicago Institute mm. um, that deals, it was really interesting to me to create all these kind of like personas and take the role um, of kind of like a colonizer. Um, and then create people to then perform and then create videos around. And this is like how it evolved. Yeah. This is like the newer work, yeah. Yeah, it's, they're beautiful. It's really like Fun. moving. Who's next? Ah. Lynn Hirschman Leeson. I think we'll skip, we talked about Lynn Hirschman Leeson. Mm -hmm. um, she does a lot of art technology, but mm -hmm. we talked about this during mine. Uh, Sandra Perry is a she's a young artist who I really really yeah. admire. She uh, works with avatars a lot, and um, this this piece was also at the ICA. It's probably my favorite piece in that um, Art in the Age of the Internet show. It's a modified you know exercise bike with these screens in front of it, with her face as the main um, as the only thing that you're looking at, and she's it's a very immersive experience but with very ordinary objects you think of an immersive experience as like vr with the headset but it's just it's like basic computer monitors and a stationary bike um and she she goes into a lot of the issues with avatars the way um, we can create avatars they're very much geared towards male white centric uh people and she had a hard time finding her own um features and body type and hair when she was trying to create her own avatar. Uh, and actually, um, I saw Jasmine Roberts speak last year, last year at MIT, and she was saying the same thing. Um, and she, she just finally created her own. <laughs> She's like, well, I can't, you know, it's, it's, I can't find someone online that looks like me, so I'm just gonna make my own. It took a long time. She mentioned like, five different um, software that she had to use to do it. Uh, so so I, Sandra Perry, I, I like a lot. She's very critical of, of technology and the internet and the way we use it in a way that I find really useful and I think we could learn from. Mm -hmm. Pippa Lottie Wrist. I saw this show mm -hmm. down Someday in New York. It was amazing. Uh, it, it was, you know, I, I was talking about immersive. Floating <laughs> in these repetitive, like, you know, like uh, imageries that were on like, these clouds on the ceiling, like you see there. And um, it was very calming, and I felt. Soap and Skin was playing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was really great. I like mm -hmm. her work because she also has been making videos for so long and the technology has gotten so much better, but still mm -hmm. has this very rough aesthetic yes. and uses the camera in and ways she, that And her choice of win. things like with, you know, the, the, the bathing women and the teacups mm -hmm. falling together in one of her pieces is like so weird. Well, this was at the New Museum, right? Yep. So this is on three different levels. So it was a re yeah. retrospect. So it was interesting to move up between the levels physically. Mm -hmm. And this is actually very different than any of the work I've ever seen. And I was really moved by the people laying on the ground and everybody mm -hmm. kind of like, 
you know, my feet are tired, <laughs> we're tired, mm-hmm. but it was like a moment for everybody like, just to relax. And that was kind of beautiful and kind yeah. of nice. Yeah. In a bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I um, Pipilotti Wrist is inspiring to me too because she does video editing in a in the commercial space mm-hmm. and does her work on the side. And I think we all have like five titles each, you know, <laughs> five jobs. And I, I found right. I found that really uh, comforting mm-hmm. to learn that she she had this intense job doing video editing mm-hmm. alongside doing this really amazing, beautiful and innovative video artwork of her own. Mm-hmm. Is there anyone Let's who start has the a question? Was <laughs> <laughs> if we haven't been talking. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I've been thinking about time throughout this, um, even before you mentioned it explicitly, Lonnie. Um, and I don't know that I have a question so much. It's just like I want to talk about time a little bit with you yeah. guys and bring this yeah. topic up. So something I noticed um, prior to that were timestamps um, mm-hmm. on not only the Tinder, which a timestamp on Tinder communicates a lot. <laughs> um, and I was reading a lot into that with yours, but also um, I'm not sure if it was documentation or whether it was um, how the piece exists in your piece. Um, the drawing, it says it's like 9.41 a.m. You know, and we talk about how um, how the internet is sort of the end of photography, like the end, and it's ephemeral, and it's the end of the decisive moment, but then it's like, no, dude, like, we've got literally the metadata says the exact point. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, I feel like the timestamps communicate a lot. I think time, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) especially with Tinder, it's interesting because it does, like you're saying, show interest or not and like how if someone waits a certain amount of time like with texting is the perfect example like i gotten in so much trouble if i don't respand in a day and yes. you have so much things like to do in a day exactly yeah. exactly yeah. and then you get supposed to be over it. asynchronous though you know but it implies so much it's, it's I have friends so much get very mad if i don't text back exactly and then you have to figure out which friends will really get offended or which friends won't and it's just it's Madness, but <laughs> it's insane. But that is especially interesting in communication to one another, how time is this thing that has come along with technology too. Like when you're on the phone with someone, rarely are you checking how long you're on the phone with them or things of that nature. But if you're texting, you're waiting to see if someone responds quickly enough or not. Um, I think time with video is also interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You and I both yeah. do a lot of performance-based video things. Right. <laughs> and it is, like, when you have something on the internet, like the spam piece, I've had a lot of friends watch it, but they scrub through How it. How long is it? And it's not that long. long? It's, Tell me. Ah, uh, I don't know. I, it was, like, oh. three minutes and three something. Minutes? Yeah. Okay. Oh, right. it's less than five minutes. It's yeah. less than five. And yeah. people just really have a hard time sitting through that one. I once in like in school, I, in grad school, I did a 15 minute video <laughs> and I almost gave myself pneumonia doing it. <laughs> so I was like, all right, you know, I'm feeling this. And they were just like, they're pissed. My, yeah. my, my committee was pissed. They're like, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you make us sit through that? You should edit that. I, I, like, I, like you're lazy well, to not edit. And that's what you mentioned with looking at how time exists in different right. ways in different parts of the world. I thought that was right. so interesting. And my thesis project in college, I edited this video down to an hour and a half. And it was the same thing where I sat down and I was like, no one's going to sit through this. So I made it an installation instead because I knew <laughs> right. that people wouldn't sit through the entire thing because it was long, long right. shots. And you had to wait and sit with it and be there. Yeah, it feels so possessive. I mean, like, you know, mm-hmm. if news is given to me in the form of video, I will spin right by it. I won't, I won't mm-hmm. look at it a, a news video. I want it written so I can scan and get what I want from it. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah. Or you but, want the three-second clip. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, but, I'm Lonnie, when you go to art galleries and museums, do you watch every video in its entirety? It was really hard, the ICA show, that one that we've been talking about, because I tried to go to every single one, but it was really hard. But I spent a lot of time, and somebody who was with me, I remember them being like, 
Like seriously? Like, <laughs> oh, I had to go to, really I had to go to that show by myself. <laughs> yeah, I had to I go back. I waited in line for the VR piece. Yep. Mm-hmm. I had to go back. I, I watched and the videos, not all of them, but most of them. Sterile's okay. piece, like, like laid with that. And, but there's a point, like it's a lot. Well, yeah. that's the thing. And as an artist, I think you have to decide. And it's really hard to gauge also what exact number are people willing to look at and what exact so number are you willing to sacrifice. Five to six minutes is what I was told. No, literally, really? technically, yeah. I and think that's too long. If you go yeah. to the marketing conference, right. three they'll minutes tell you to two. 15 seconds. Right? And that's like if you want to get cut and dry with it. And that's just like messed up when you're talking about things that yeah. is like centuries of like, you know, like colonialism, you know, like, you know, people like, you know, losing their land or like gentrification. Like, how do you sum that up in three minutes? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, but I think part of what we grapple with is that we don't have to. Right. Um, but sometimes you get in this tug of war with yourself, thinking of other people, actually, actually digesting your work, and and you think, oh well, then I need to make it shorter because we don't trust them to sit down and watch it. But it's interesting. Like so like the thing of body and yeah, the thing of body and like digital is like I learned that when I performed it live, people were like, I want more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which was like interesting to see the dichotomy in that. I was just wondering if you go to um, the Museum of Fine Arts, how much time do you spend in front of each painting? And there's some that I just go back to. I mean, I'm more drawn to sculpture, personally. <laughs> um, but yeah, there are some paintings that like I'll stand a long time and just stare at them. And some people would just be like, why does that matter? Yeah. Because then I, but mm-hmm. then it would be like the breakdown of all the like, the imagery and the you know there's a lot to there's a lot I'm to break down to think sometimes. Of, I'm trying to think of one that I would just like sit there and stare at for a long time, but um, I can't. I can't. Has the digital experience highlighted our relationship to time, or is it just the same thing in a different realm? I think it's it's changed it in that we we try to be in so many places at once right. that time isn't the same. It's not linear, mm-hmm. so. It's, it's not linear, and thus, that's why we feel like we have to shorten everything, because mm-hmm. the distractions are so, are so strong, you know? Like, non-linear editing changed everything, right? Like, yeah. when you have your master, like, that's all you have, mm-hmm. and you cut it up, you <laughs> up, and you're like, I'm sorry. And then you're like, wow, like, what do I do? Because then you have to take all that time to make yeah. another master. Now we just have this, like, infinite amount of changes. And in theory, you could create an infinite amount of like number of versions of that Mm -hmm. video or whatever and then your sequence is infinite but of course you don't have enough time to do that (laughs) and of course with so many things available you want to be watching everything too right which is why you run through the mfa to try to see every piece (laughs) and then you get all this fomo fomo yeah and depression (laughs) and so if it's immersive you know that then changes it right Mm -hmm. yeah but then somebody messes up the speakers and it's not playing that's a different experience which happens or if you're looking at it through like a sidewall right but this is all real stuff so that's why it's interesting to think about like time and space yeah and how do we like edit that and i feel like with time i keep trying to not use a iphone or smartphone and the thing it comes down to is the gps but also in your personal life my alarm clock which I can get another alarm clock, but that's this core thing that I've become so accustomed now to setting five separate alarms that play back to back to back, that now to, I've bought an alarm clock that will just go one time and I've been late to multiple things. (laughs) So I, it's, that's a very (laughs) silly way to talk about time, but it's true. <laughs> that's true. You but throw that, something at so it. I dream a lot. <laughs> I just go right back. Yeah. I actually started the Awake Project as a way to get my ass out of bed. <laughs> mm. Right. So I had I, I had rules at first, and I, I think I had a time. I, I was like, I have to take I the like picture that. in the first like three seconds that I wake up, and I had to actually get out of bed. Mm. Mm-hmm. So it's funny if you go through all the photos. Mm. In the beginning, I'm in front of a wall or like a. I think I actually was in, in my um, living room a lot because I would actually get out of the room because um, my husband was sleeping. <laughs> and I, I would take a photo where there was some light. But then if you go towards the end where I was like starting to get really sick of the project, I was just like laying in bed and I, would, I, I had no more rules. I just have to take the photo whenever and then I'd put it down and I'd go back to sleep. <laughs> so it's totally failed. Lost. It just all failed. The whole point in the with all the rules. Um, but I that time was really important because I didn't want too much time to lapse 
and then I was awake, and then I was thinking about the mm -hmm. photo. Is there anybody else here who works with uh, technology and art intersecting? Yes. Anybody? Yes. Anybody? Anybody? Yes. <laughs> Good most. Do you have any uh, things you want to add? Well, um, you talked a lot about how technology is interfacing with these other things to create a synthesis of the two, and like a like oppositional art, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, have you found any instances where the technology was hindering the message, or where the synthesis mm -hmm. was less because of the integration of technology? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like that's why I went to performance, because the video yeah. was just kind of like, it was limiting the three minutes, the six minutes wasn't cutting it. Um, and then I recently applied for a grant, and I got some feedback, which was awesome. And they told me, like, the work wasn't sticky enough. <sighs> yeah, so it was a marketing term. Um, what does that mean? Yeah, I, know, that I know, I know. But, like, I, literally the sensors are extremely <laughs> sticky. <laughs> the sensors are very sticky. Um, no. <laughs> but it was interesting because, you know, there's also a statement of it's just plants. And, and also that made me think that maybe the technology wasn't intense enough. There, there wasn't enough of a catch for how I was using the technology. Because mm -hmm. they were kind of like, what's the end game? They luckily didn't use that term, which I would have just, just hang on the phone. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but just thinking about kind of like, like wrong with me, that, that comment of it's just plants. It's not sticky enough. And like, what does that mean? And like, how then does something that incorporates like nature, the environment, and like technology, how does that become something that becomes sticky enough for somebody to want to like, you know, mm -hmm. fund or for a city to for, like want to? Right. I think it's yeah. those are different questions. Like for people to care, but then for um, people to fund different right. people, you know. So right. So it's like interesting. Like it was very uncomfortable, and I was like, well, this isn't really like that's not this. They what are just about. plants. <laughs> they aren't just plants, and I was like, this that's isn't really point. about marketing. As I unfortunately had to do that yeah. to get to this point to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I think, what paid off the most of that conversation. Yeah. It's interesting. I think technology is also not 100% reliable. <laughs> so <laughs> when you're having an installation or a performance or things like that, mm -hmm. I've just, and you practice it five different times and everyone has it nailed down and then the day of something inevitably happens. The so, dies. and then the piece is about technology and then the technology <laughs> is not fails. working. And so. <laughs> I've had situations like that that have been. Um, this less happens than with ideal. me in real life all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. But I think that also Without is very real. And I, in those it moments, is. I say, yeah. like, look, this is part of it then. Right. We have to just see it as that because technology isn't perfect. And then, you know, we can have a whole conversation about how this <laughs> relates to everything that we're going through as a society right now. So. Right. The failure. People don't like that conversation right. <laughs> yeah. when the tech is failing, but outside of it, yeah. it's normally good. And I think, back to your question where you're saying, you know, when is it not, I think it's more when, when is it just not appropriate, but I think a different question, like what you're saying, is when, when do you just hate it and don't mm -hmm. want to use it anymore? Yeah. And they're two different questions, but often you just, like, can't handle it anymore, so you have to change it, or or back, back the technology up because it's just taking too long or it doesn't work or you have to you know, troubleshoot. And um, that's, that's where I think I've had the most issues is just trying to figure out the balance. You know? Well, want, then it all I perfectly represents technology. life. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's, yeah. it's much like in, in our work life and our personal life. You know? Like, yeah, g archiving my digital photos has been on my to-do list for like <laughs> four years, you know, um, I'll get to it eventually. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have like a million photos. And, mm -hmm. and I, I have 17,000 that I me. need to <laughs> download from my phone. But I think I, I struggle with how much to use technology. I want to keep using it. I want to keep learning more because I find it really interesting. And I want to be relevant and be, um, just keep, just learn more because and it's always changing, so mm -hmm. you have to. But I also want to take a break from it mm -hmm. and just yeah. draw. Well, and I think with the photos, especially, like I think all the time about okay, if I have grandkids, what photos am I going to show them? Because my mother mm -hmm. and grandmother have books, a couple of them, and that's that. And if you just have seventeen thousand photos, like, what do you choose to show to? 
kids in the future and it's just such a complex thing to me and that goes back to time also and like how and archiving yeah. <laughs> and it's just like how do you manage that and what stands out and what doesn't and it's confusing well you can just like donate it as ephemera from the period to some mm -hmm. library at that point yeah, and then they'll do. figure but out how to chop it up so and use it data now they yeah. don't they, they don't, don't know want what to it. do with it yeah and libraries haven't caught up to the digital archives at least to the point of trying to archive mm. all these millions and billions mm. of pieces of data and mm. photos it's it's a lot mm -hmm. but i think that's just really interesting like i mean i keep using it in my work because it is so painful to work with and it's like inevitable. Technology. Yeah. yeah. Like it's like I could ignore it, but then I'm just going to be behind the times. I'm not going to. And it's like something, it's like a tool to me. Right? When well, you want to use it, that's the right. effect or the, you know, whatever that you want. But then like, like I have my own rules and one of it's like throw in something that drives you crazy. <laughs> and so like. That doesn't just like, happen automatically. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but collaboration, being outside, <laughs> working with weather, technology. And so all those variables, but it's like kind of like, <coughs> I don't know, I, I, I think it's interesting because that whole kind of experience too, like growing up, like, um, like because my father grew up in that, that time in the 1950s, like he's, you know, he's much older than some of my other peers, parents and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, um, there was like this pivotal moment, like as an architect where he had to decide to um, either get in with the times to do digital CAD or not. And that was like life changing. And so I found that really interesting to see I how... I actually went through that exact experience yeah. myself because I grew up in the 50s. Yeah, he refused. And, and I refused he continued, too. <laughs> yeah, and that like, changed his life. And it kind of changed yeah. mine. And I was just like, I'm never going to do that. I'm always going to embrace it. And so we like, kind of have run these parallel lies, which has been kind of interesting. On the other hand, I wound up in sustainable technologies, which is all about <laughs> this yeah. stuff. So yeah. you never know. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even if you try to actively reject it, you still have to deal with it. Right. Yes. Right. It's unavoidable and, now. So back yeah. to the beginning, it's pervasive, ubiquitous, and yeah. runs us. Yeah. Unless no, we go I off mean, on a camping trip and turn it all off. Yeah. There's Which so I many do. stories. Yes. <laughs> when it comes down to it, like, you know, you can't really get away from when it. Can. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. So uh, my name is Charity. I, I'm also a, an artist that works on the intersection of um, art and technology and yep. a lot of different crossroads. Um, including like archives and humanities and whatnot. Hmm. My question is mostly for you, Keaton. Um, so your work specifically with Tinder and even like the spam piece, mm -hmm. I guess I'm just wondering like what, what is the deeper message of what you were trying to convey? Because you said with the spam piece, um, the fact that they, that they kind of like pulled out your, um, your profile and said that it was quote unquote spam was something that you felt was personally offensive but like you went into the piece specifically not representing yourself not having any actual images of yourself not actually having conversations but communicating completely through emoji so was that how before could you or after it was after but i would say that i represented myself in the way that i wanted to which was by choosing not to use my face like whenever i've been on dating apps during this time, I w was intentionally, for art purposes or not, not putting my face on, because I wanted to see who would respond to that, because I think that I, whoever I would want to meet, who I would end up, say, potentially going out with, it wouldn't be based on the way that I look. Right. So that was a choice of how I wanted to represent myself in that way. But with being called spam, that was just such an insane concept to me, because it was this word that was created, you know, you have this terminology that's something that's both physical and digital. And spam online is something that you put in your trash folder. And you... It is not wanted. It is not wanted. Yeah. And so, because being, saying that the way I represented myself online felt like something that is unwanted was where everything kind of began. And it was because it was that specific word and the history of that word and how mm -hmm. it exists in this physical and digital form. And historically, it's really complex because mm -hmm. of like the war, mm -hmm. you know, of like uh, it, it, the spam is so popular in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it has to do with like rations and, you know, it's yeah, like what's yes. available and survival. Mm -hmm. um, 
Was that your whole question? Um, I don't know if it was. Well, yeah, I was actually looking for more clarification on, um, because I know, like for me, um, I feel like art is something that is used to actually get at the actual, like, deeper core of, you know, what makes us human and, you know, like to actually illuminate for people who might not even really consider these topics, like, um, things that are that are important and things that really need to be said and really need to be displayed. Like, I think that, you know, your work absolutely with, like, you know, you crushing the plant, you know, it being this kind of like this, this, um, this symbol of colonization and how that, that colonization has, you know, impacted you as an individual and especially like as a woman who was mm -hmm. from Hawaii that was annexed, you know? Mm -hmm. Or like even your work with you putting your, your heartbeat on this physical piece of an actual animal and then having your face on it in a digital space and you're like, you're mixing all these different things. Like I feel like those works actually were saying something deeper. I feel like your work with the spam was probably, like to me, it came across as you wanting to take umbrage at something and then using that as, as kind of as your, your open doorway to create a work that was visually unappealing, but at the same time didn't really have any depth to it. Well, so for me, the work is about just the general concept of identity and representing yourself online. And if we have these structures and these systems that are saying that we can't represent ourselves online, then what does that mean for everything, for avatars, for LinkedIn, for who we exist as online, which is obviously a big conversation that's happening now. And we have not only one version of ourselves online, but multiple versions of ourselves. So if we have these applications that are limiting the way that we do that, what does that look like for how people can represent any aspect of their selves online? So that would be the general theme of what it was about. And then the visuals and the sound specifically were to match the feeling of being called spam and just the ickiness that comes from that core concept of not being able to re represent who I am in the way that I want to. And then knowing that if I don't want to represent myself in the way that Tinder allows me to, then I can't go on this dating app and maybe I really wanted to meet the love of my life on the dating app, and if I can't represent myself in the way that I want to, then how can I find someone who will want that version of me? Right. Or even just the question of who has that choice, who has that mm -hmm. control to decide who, who we are and how we can present ourselves. Yeah. And who <laughs> can say that you should be off the application and that, you, that your identity that feels like spam. Right, that you're like, that's trash. But for the integrity of the application, right? Because people are going on Tinder because they actually want to meet a person. They actually want to connect with the person, somebody that they might potentially be in a relationship with, have children with, whatnot. And so if somebody came across this interaction with you where they're trying to connect with you and you're just replying to them with emojis and you don't even have any photos and you're on the site that you didn't create, it was created by somebody else, the, the, if those people complain to the people who own the site, obviously they have the ability and they have the right to stop anybody from using the site who will cause people to move away from it. Yeah, I guess my, but, yeah, it's why would that be a bad thing? Like that, maybe emojis are, and they were two separate projects. The emoji project was one installation and the spam was, I wasn't using emojis at that time. So this was just you not using your, your mm -hmm. face and your body yeah. as your not profile my, photos. Not my face, but my, the mask, the mask and art, my artwork right. and my website, my bio just linked to my website. And so I was hoping that instead of swiping right or left based on what I looked like, that people would go to my work online and see these different ideas and versions of me and then create a conversation based off of that. Without knowing what your face looks like. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's super relevant now as we're dealing with Facebook, especially being trying to figure out, oh, how do I control this? How do I stay in the driver's seat as the puppeteer for this platform, but still allow democracy to function the way that it should? You know, And I think mm -hmm. your piece gets at the, the control that's an issue with these, you know, like Mark Zuckerberg's making final decisions about what's okay and what's not okay to say online. And what's news and what's not news? You who know, gets to see I mean, it? And how many people get to see it? They decide so. Right. Who gets to see it and how? Like, when is it genocide? When is it not? Like, the, it, it's it's a gateway into a lot of 
much bigger issues that, that are finally becoming big enough issues that they're being discussed in, in Congress, you know? Um, so I think it's, it's a, like it's spam, it's, mm -hmm. it's a can of spam. <laughs> so it's, it's not, it doesn't mm, well, feel that term. deep in the video maybe, but I think it, it definitely scratches the surface for me on some mm -hmm. really relevant issues um, like right now. Mm. So and with that, I think we're going to wind up our discussion here and our talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, oh, you guys man. are awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for coming.